Welcome to the summer program of Women in Philanthropy. We're pleased to present Saving Water and Pollinators with Native Plants, informing us on the value of using native plants in our gardens. I am Susan Rice. I'm president of Women in Philanthropy. Women in Philanthropy at UCLA celebrates and inspires women's giving across the UCLA campus. You can see it in my background. We foster women's participation in volunteer leadership positions. And since the beginning, our extraordinary women leaders have served UCLA on departmental advisory councils, task forces, student mentoring, scholarship advisories on the University of California Board of Regents and the UCLA Foundation Board of Trustees. In 2019, Women in Philanthropy celebrated our 25th anniversary. I am proud to say that we are now 3,000 women strong. All contribute time, talent, and treasure to every corner of the university. Since COVID-19 hit our world, Women in Philanthropy has provided all events in this virtual format. In addition, we added programs for summer, both last year and now today, this year. We've been really delighted at the enormous and enthusiastic response. We welcome the involvement of many of you, all of you in planning events for all our members. We like to include the broadest and most diverse participation from you we would be pleased to respond to any inquiry you may have. We like to think that bringing intellectual and emotional discussion broadens appreciation of UCLA by all of us. I'd now like to introduce our speaker for today, Orchid Black. In addition to being beautiful, our gardens present the perfect place to become more sustainable using native plants in a landscape that can make a garden more resilient and drought tolerant. In addition to attracting delightful visitors of bugs and birds and butterflies, you'll find you draw something else yourself. You may just find yourself out in your garden more enjoying these delightful critters every day. And for those of you who like me, who don't have a garden, I bet you still have plants in different places. And that's why you've tuned in because you want to learn more. Our presenter today is Orca Black. She is a UCLA Extension lecturer presenting numerous courses in sustainable and native landscaping for several years. She's a garden designer and owner of Native Sanctuary. The firm offers native plant consulting habitat creation and sustainable design services to the greater Los Angeles area. Orchid has served on the board of California Native Plant Society and recently served as the chapter council chair. She writes and lectures about native plants, water saving strategies and sustainable gardening. Orchid will introduce us to successful native landscaping, how to attract pollinators, the latest water management practices, as well as some tips for success. Orchid, if you would like to begin now, I will tune out and then later we will hear, we will uh, address the questions and answers that those of you have submitted and I will read them off to Orchid. So delighted you're with us today, Orchid, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, attracting pollinators, and the latest uh, water uh, management techniques is maybe a little much for 45 minutes, but we'll do a lot on attracting pollinators and just a little on water management if we get there, um, if we ever get past milkweed, basically. So um, it seems like everyone is here in California. So you know that California is, um, is a very special place and with native plants um, uh, uh, we have 
California has more plants than any other state. And in fact, we have more rare plants than many states have plants. Um, just a few pictures. Some of these are from Mike Evans on the beauty of California and, and why we care and why native plants matter. Um, and um, California has miles and miles of coastline and California was wetter than it is now. And some of that is our practices. Here's a Montane Meadow. Um, this is the Tahone Ranch. And the Carrizo Plain. So this is what California looked like before we started in on, on how we live and how we feed ourselves. Um, so the, the principal threats to pollinators are habitat loss when we, uh, when we turn habitat into agriculture or when we build over it or when we mine it. Um, tillage, because tillage destroys native plants and also um, sometimes larvae. Um, disease, and I will talk about that when we get to non-native milkweed and of course pesticides. And um, sometimes people don't always realize that uh, that when they run outside with um, some pesticides that they found at the home store, that that is reducing butterflies and bees and and um, beneficial insects. So, so that is the problem in a nutshell. And of course, we know that we are losing pollinators quickly, and many people are worried about. Um, bees, but we should also be worried about native bees. So the good news is that pollinators can survive and even thrive in small patches of habitat. So um, imagine, uh, and, and this actually happened to me, um, but Im imagine acres and acres of lawn, um, or imagine driving up the five. If, if you're a pollinator, um, those are those are similar experiences. And, um, and there's only a couple of places to stop and eat on the five, if you've driven that lately um, or ever. And, um, and I, uh, uh, about 20 years ago, I was doing some maintenance on a native garden that I had never been to that um, another designer had worked on. And I was in a beautiful, beautiful, you know, uh, large houses, large lawns, bird song in the distance. And um, when I got to the site, all the birds were at this one garden. Um, and there were butterflies there, and there was a, a spider web that, that the owners were carefully um, uh, conserving. And I realized right then, um, in, in living color, in all the color, that, that gardens really matter. So that's, you know, even a couple of pots could make a difference to pollinators who are looking for food. So urban gardens have less pesticide pressure and less tillage. And the mixed nature of urban gardens can make a, uh, a better habitat than, for example, the side of an agricultural field. Um, Native plants evolve with native insects. This seems obvious, but sometimes people don't always make the connection. And that's what I'm hoping to do for people today. And, and I think, you know, from the questions in advance that most people uh, in this meeting already know this. Um, but a few, I wanna just check in with a few basic ideas. Um, one is that um, birds need native insects. So plants need native insects to pollinate them, but um, birds need native insects to eat, and 90% of insects only feed on native plants. So that's a, a, a huge thought right there. When you go to the nursery and buy a plant that isn't native, even if a butterfly might use its nectar, it can't use it as a host plant. And so we'll focus on a few kinds of plants that are good host plants as well as nectar plant. Um, so, but also, you know, pollinators need gardens, but gardens need pollinators. So visitation by native bees increases fruit set, 
um, by quite a lot. So if, if you don't have natives, you will have less pollination in your vegetable garden if you have one. So I like tomatoes. So um, I like to have some native wildflowers near them so that they can be pollinated. Um, and, and one of the sad things that I have been reading lately is that um, farmers are, are making robots to do their pollination because we've lost so many pollinators. And, and to me, this is just honestly a tragedy. So pollinators have other needs. They need continuous blooms. So if there is a season where your garden is not blooming, then pollinators are not eating. Pollinators need mass planting, so they can find a single plant, but it's much better for them if they can find a mass of plants and just move from plant to plant. Um, pollinators need nectar plants, so um, and it's helpful if there's continuous nectar bloom. And pollinators need host plants as well. And, and um, we'll talk about that in a minute when we get to milkweed and other uh, and the buckwheat. So birds need native insects. This is um, not as well known as it could be, um, but 96% of terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. So, you know, four out of 100 don't, that's not a lot. And um, we are losing bird species as well as plant species and pollinators. Here's a gross beak and it's a seed eating bird, but its children or its hatchlings cannot eat seed. Um, baby birds can't have to have caterpillars to eat. So um, here is, and, and I took that picture and this picture also. Um, this is not a Carolina chickadee, it's a chickadee in the San Bernardino mountains. But um, chickadees need more than 5,000. This is really hard for me to imagine, um, you know, chickadee parents uh, running back and forth seeking out caterpillars um, to feed their hatchlings. And so caterpillars are baby food for birds. birds uh, baby birds cannot eat hard-shelled insects, so they must have caterpillars. And caterpillars, um, in general, only grow on native plants. And one of the saddest things, and I don't have this slide and you don't want to see it, but um, this, one of the saddest things I've seen um, in, in my entire time in native plants is a slide that Doug, Douglas Ptolemy has of um, a failed chickadee nest that's filled with seeds. So the parents could not find enough seed for um, or enough uh, caterpillars for the birds. And so they tried to feed their hatchling seed and, and the hatchlings um, did not live. So um, that's, that's kind of the wages of having non-native plants dominate the landscape. Um, so um, people put out their hummingbird feeders and we love to do that and I've done that a lot too. Um, but 80% of hummingbirds diet is insects. And again, those insects just live on native plants. So um, even hummingbirds need, you know, not just nectar sources, they need sources of insects. So I wanna talk about plants in broad categories. Um, and the first broad category is the two best um, genera that Ptolemy says um, are best for California for um, caterpillars to live on. And one of them are the oak species and everyone is familiar with our coast live oak. We have 14 oak species in Southern California. So any of them will do. One of my favorites is the Engelman oak, which only grows in two places in California and in Pasadena and in the Murrieta area. Um, it's a beautiful small oak that's often used as a street tree. And everyone said where they're calling in from and I am calling in from Sierra Madre today. Um, and so the Engelman is used um, extensively as a street tree in Sierra Madre and Pasadena. And it, it's a, it can get huge in the end, but it's a, it's a nice small oak. So um, here it is on the Santa Rosa Plateau. Um, and oaks can have up to 5,000 biotic associations. That includes fungi and insects and, you know, all kinds of things. But um, and, and the larger creatures. So, and this is a lupin in front of it and, um, and a, 
a meadow of native grasses. And, and that's um, somewhat rare in Southern California. There's a lot more native grasslands in Northern California around the Bay Area than there are down here. Um, the other uh, super plant for, um, for feeding birds on caterpillars is the prunus species. And this is the holly leaf cherry, but there's also the Catalina cherry. And a little harder to find is um, Prunus virginiana. Um, and, um, and I do not have this slide, but if your plants don't look eaten, you're not feeding the birds. Um, so on to butterflies. Butterfly populations are dwindling. There's two flyways for monarchs. There's the California flyway and the Midwest flyway and agriculture has pretty much destroyed that flyway and um, and also logging in Mexico where the birds overwinter. Our birds don't don't make that same flight, although some of them do. And um, by the way, hand raised monarchs do not make um, their those long distance flights. Um, so they they must be naturally raised for that to happen. And um, so, so people who have been uh, paying attention and reading the news are, are all, I need some milkweed right now. And, um, and a lot of them are getting the wrong one. Um, and I can tell from the early questions that um, some of you know that, um, but for those who don't, the orange or yellow milkweeds, the Asclepias tuberosa and other milkweeds that you could get um, at a big box store or, or at a chain nursery are, are not the correct ones. Any native milkweed, even not the local milkweed is better. And the reason is there are diseases, are fungal diseases that can kill monarchs that persist on the orange and yellow milkweed. And if you have the orange and yellow milkweed um, and you don't want to take it out, you can, um, you can cut it back, prune it to the ground, um, and around the end of October, and uh, and then um, let it let it grow back in the spring. But the fact that it does is not deciduous is important to our native uh, butterflies. So milkweed is a host plant. And someone asked, um, I bought a native milkweed from a local nursery. Looks healthy, but has not bloomed. Is it any use to monarchs? And so. I uh, want to um, make that distinction for people between host plants, that's plants that the caterpillars live on, and nectar plants. So um, milkweed is, is both. It is a great nectar plant, and you can see this velvet ant uh, um, accessing the nectar. But for monarchs, it's a host plant. So the larva of the caterpillars live on it. So doesn't have to bloom for the caterpillars to live on it. And um, it only needs to have leaves. And so uh, the easiest one to get is Asclepias fascicularis, narrow leaf milkweed. And um, here's a monarch on it taken by my friend, Jim Otterstrom. I, and, um, and it does have narrow leaves and it grows in like clay lenses. So it needs a little more water than you would think. Um, so this one is fairly easy to get. Um, you can even start it from seed. Most, uh, most of the local nurseries, uh, native plant nurseries do have it most of the time, not all of the time. Um, and, um, and someone asked, where do I get it? And so that's the Theodore Payne Foundation. If you're in Los Angeles, um, the California Botanic Garden, although they close for the summer, though they open again in October, and Tree of Life Nursery, which if you've never been to any of these places, they are all worth a visit. And Tree of Life is down in San Juan Capistrano, but it is a great day trip. And they, um, they say right now that they have plenty of native milkweeds and they are not going to sell out. Um, I do want to say that also uh, the La Cunada Armstrong, for some reason, has Asclepias area, uh, speciosa, which is not a local one, but it still is a, a good milkweed for native butterflies. It's from Northern California and it grows just fine here. 
So here's a picture of the Asclepius fascicularis. And, um, and people often will just plant one of them. So here's one bunch. It's a nice, healthy bunch. But um, let's look what happens. So I get these panic phone calls. Um, I have monarch caterpillars and I need some milkweed right now. Okay, so it's too late then. I mean, you might be able to find some milkweed, but you're not gonna find a large pot worth of milkweed. And so you need to plant your milkweed in advance and plant plenty of it. And so um, here in one of my client gardens is are the monarch caterpillars on the um, native milkweed and uh, Asclepius fascicularis. And we had plenty of it in this garden. Um, which is calming to know um, because we had three on one plant. So you might think, oh, well, I'll just get a caterpillar, but you can get um, enough caterpillars to strip your plant. So that whole thing that I showed in the beginning of having uh, mass planting is important and especially for milkweed. And it does go dormant in the winter and that's an important part of things. So you say, oh, I don't want this bare patch, but you could put a pot there. Um, you could put a sculpture there. You could just be happy that there will be milkweed soon. Um, dormancy is part of California. And part of our sense of place is that some things go summer dormant and some things go winter dormant. So here's a different milkweed. This is woolly pod milkweed or um, uh, uh, Asclepius aerocarpa, sometimes it's called Indian milkweed. Um, it can tolerate some drier conditions and we do have other milkweeds um, that are, are Southern California local, but any California milkweed is fine. Um, and this one is quite widespread um, to the desert, to the mountains and, um, and, and pretty easy in general. And then I want to talk about plants in broad categories. So, um, and so even though every plant is named in this in this deck, um, I I'm not going to go over each plant. But I, I first want to talk about daisy-like plants. They are really one of the great sources of nectar, and um, and many beneficial insects live on them, and. Uh, Daisy-like plants, every flower is a bouquet. So um, butterflies like to come to clustered flowers and daisy-like plants, um, which are the aster family, um, do have these cluster of flowers in the center. And each of those little dots with the brown center is one whole flower. And then the flower head is the inflorescence and these ray flowers on the outside may or may not um, be full flowers, but they're there to let the pollinators know to come there. So days of the like flowers are, are easy. A lot of them bloom all the time. Um, for example, this uh, coast sunflower bush in Celia, California, Californica, it blooms literally all the time, January, you know, December, January, um, etc. And we'll see a picture of its habit later. Um, but you can see also this flower head has tons of little flowers and, and pollinators need that and bees do too. Um, here is a seaside daisy. And um, here are uh, some butterflies on more daisy like plants. This is probably um, the, the Helianthus gracile. And, um, and even dandelions are um, daisy, are in the aster family. Um, there is a native dandelion um, in Big Bear, and most people don't know that, and it's super, super rare. And one of its threats is hybridization, but if all you had was dandelions in your yard, that would make a difference um, versus just having lawn. So when you see, a lawn that's full of dandelions and maybe clover. Don't feel badly, feel happy. Um, then of course we have uh, the Achillea, which is a cluster of flowers and it has those flowers in the center. So each of these tiny 
flowers is in whole inflorescence and um and a host for beneficials and super super easy to grow a little more water than most native plants but uh, native plants take so much less water than conventional i hate that i have to even say that conventional plants um that uh that the water savings is large um balia this is a desert plant that grows great um almost anywhere it's easy it blooms all the time and again that daisy like head and uh, and and honestly i think i took this picture of the balia the desert marigold in december um the bahiopsis um san diego sunflower again blooms all the time you can have uh the san diego sunflower you know in winter blooming just like this and then our our native thistle um i this one is easy to grow most people are like i'm not growing that but i had it in a pot and it was stunning and i had hummingbirds and butterflies um here is the coast sunflower bush in its habit it is kind of wide about six feet wide by about four feet high um, it stands a lot of pruning, although that's not our focus today. And um, a lot of birds use the seed as well. So it's pollinators and seed eating birds for this plant. And then the seaside daisy also blooms all the time and will, you know, bloom in a dark location, like behind your, you know, behind your garage in a, in a small strip to the north. This is your plant. Um, goldenrod, because it's that season, and remember, pollinators need continuous bloom, and it does start blooming now to the fall. It is not the source of allergies. Um, it was confused with another plant, ragweed. Um, here are just a few pictures of some more local plants that are mostly not in cultivation, unless you ask at Theodore Payne, the Erica Marias and other plants, but you can see they're all in the aster family with that disc head and those ray flowers. And um, these were mostly taken by Mickey Long. So Erica Maria, Erica Maria, um, and Baccarus, this is mule fat. Um, one of my first jobs had a mule fat on the job and we kept it there, even though it's not the most attractive, but it was setting the stage for the rest of the plants. Um, buckwheat, and so I'm just again going to talk about plants as a broad stroke of plants. And so the buckwheats are both a host plant and a nectar plant, and attractive to bees. And um, and it has in the Southern California Butterfly Book this particular buckwheat, uh, um, Ariagna uh, fasciculatum, California buckwheat had more entries as a host plant than any other plant in the whole book. So, um, but there's many, there's a buckwheat for every garden. And if you just only had a buckwheat garden, your garden would be um, quality habitat. So here is a skipper uh, on uh, California buckwheat. And, um, and they're in the, into Ventura County and on the Conejo grade, there is Conejo buckwheat. Um, this is an amazing low plant um, with these lovely sulfur colored blooms. Um, here is a, a cultivated variety of the California buckwheat and there are uh, low growing ones that are low wide. Um, there are ones that drape. Um, there are ones that are upright. So we're not gonna see all of them, but it's important to know that they exist. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is an easy plant for the parkway for a sunny front location. Um, it's from the Channel Islands and it is, um, again, a great host and nectar plant. And then Ariagum umbilatum, more from elevation, but it grows fine down here and it's a lovely yellow mound. And, um, and then on to bees, there are around 1600 native bee species in California, my friend. Annette took this uh, picture of native bees on a Ceanothus. And then you can buy habitat for bees. You can drill habitat. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that because there's plenty on the internet, but um, don't just buy the cheap native bee uh, box that you see at Target. It probably is not the right kind of holes 
or the right kind of um, shelter for bees. Bees need specific things, so do your research. Um, my friend Tell Terry Keller took this. This is just a, a small sampling of some of those 1600 native bees on again, a daisy-like flower, tidy tips. Um, many, many things live on tidy tips, not just native bees. Um, he had 13 slides of everything that lives on, on this plant from bees to flies to a fox, foxes and squirrels eating them. So um, this is an easy wildflower. Bees like blue. This is how I remember that. And they like yellow and orange and red less so and some some native plants uh, turn orange once they have been pollinated or red once they've been pollinated from yellow or blue um, so that the bees know to go to the other flowers. So red is a signal not to go there. Although one of, you'll see in a minute why that's funny. But so bees like blue and bees like yellow, a monkey flower and blue-eyed grass. Um, so bees like a bee-shaped hole. And so this is actually one of my favorite smells um, in plants at all, of any plant. People are all about their lavenders, but I'm all about Lepicinia fragrance. And um, the bumblebees love it too. Um, again, a bee-shaped hole for this penstemon. And um, you may already have penstemon margarita bop if you have any native plants at all. Um, you probably do, but uh, this one is also one of my favorites. Um, and then um, another broad group of plants is the Ceanothus. And you might say, how do I say that? And it's C, I know this. Um, so just quickly a view of a few of them. I'm not gonna talk about them except to say they are blue to be attractive to bees. They have flower clusters that are attractive to butterflies and they are, um, they bloom in late January, early February. So they are a bridge when not much else is blooming and they turn the hills, hills blue in some places. So here's one of the easiest ones, Ray Hartman, um, a very garden tolerant, can be water. Um, Ceanothus concha is great for the interior. And here's another concha. Here's Yankee Point in, in Midtown. It, it is four feet high and in this instance, it is 10 feet wide, but here it is pruned. You can't prune it any smaller than this. Um, in the famous Gottlieb garden, um, which you can, there are videos online of this garden, especially the wildlife it has attracted in Beverly Hills. And so native plants can be um, pruned and tidy. They don't always have to just look wild. Although if you leave the seed heads and things that people would usually prune off, um, that's important for birds. Um, a couple of nectar plants, um, Monardella odoratissima, um, or any of the Monardellas are great for summer, and they're also a really nice minty tea. Um, Verbena lilacina is a year-round bloomer from Cedros Island, and, um, and so this is an important nectar plant. And then hummingbirds are pollinators too. I'm going to go quickly through um, a few hummingbird plants, and I probably won't talk much about each one. All the good butterfly pictures are by Mickey Long, and here's a picture of a hummingbird also from him. Um, manzanitas, um, the iconic plant of California. Most of the endemism in manzanitas is here in California, um, and they go from small to tall, and just like the sea note this is, and this is how hummingbirds and um, native bees make it through the winter, especially um, especially December. Um, December, January is when most of the manzanitas bloom. Some of them bloom later. But um, when there's nothing else blooming, there are manzanitas for the hummingbirds and the native bees. Um, then the flowers are beautiful and they can also be pink. And um, this is also from Mike Evans at Tree of Life. Um, Here's a bee in the Calliandra, so they will go to pollen and nectar, um, but this is mostly a hummingbird plant. Um, Gambelia, island bush snapdragon is a great plant for shade or, or sun, depending. There are some sunny cultivars. Um, the coral bells, I've seen a hummingbird work each and every one of these tiny blooms. If you told me it happened, I wouldn't have believed it, but it was really like five feet from me doing that. 
Um, there are lots of different colors of coral bells, and this is just probably the easiest one to find. Um, so there are several uh, red penstemons. This is the San Gabriel uh, variety, but there's scarlet bugler, the penstemon centranthifolius, and they're mostly spring bloomers. And then the ribes, again, how hummingbirds and, and native bees make it through the winter. Um, so this is a Northern California one, but kind of stunning in shade. And then um, for the fall, starting um, now, we have the California fuchsias do bloom until December. So there is, there is continuous bloom in California. And no, you don't have to go crazy with schedules. Some things bloom all the time. And um, everyone's favorite, um, this one also makes a good syrup for ice cream besides feeding the hummingbirds. And for part shade are usually on the south side of a tree. And then the salvias. So we've gone to the salvias. There are too many to put in, in this um, talk, um, but there's a lot of salvia, clevelandi, um, leucophila crosses. Um, there are too many to note, but most of them look like this. They're kind of big, um, can be five feet by five feet. There are some smaller salvias. So a salvia in your garden will attract many different types of things, butterflies, bees, because many of them are blue, beneficial insects and hummingbirds. So their um, salvias are a multi-purpose plant. Um, here's one of my favorites. This is a desert plant, salvia pachyphyla. Um, I tried it in Pasadena, it didn't fly and it's not gonna work for Westwood at all. But um, many of the pictures that I have available to me are of this plant and it's great for cooking too. So this is that plant again and again and again. Um, so, and then don't forget the grasses. This is one of our easiest grasses. If you have a garden with fountain grass, it's time to let it go. Fountain grass is usually invasive. If you have a Mexican feather grass, it's also invasive. You can replace those grasses with deer grass and um, feed the birds and the butterflies. Um, so a, a new deer grass with a new manzanita. And, um, and this isn't, you know, all about, you know, all the basics of wildlife. It's more about pollinators, but water is the most essential element of life because otherwise you can't make coffee. No, everything needs water. And, um, and so fountains, if we have a drier garden that we're not spending as much water, um, historical cultures like um, the Moors and the Spanish um, and the Romans all had interior, uh, interior places with fountain. And so um, it relieves the dryness and also allows the critters something to have. So um, then, you know, another fountain and another a seep fountain with a native uh, um, uh, bush anemone. That flower is a big orange scented flower, but not our thing today. And then, um, but you don't have to have a big water thing. This is a little water that um, one of my friends maintains for, for the bees and the bees all leave when she fills it up and they come back. And so she thinks they know that she's feeding them. And birds also need rocks in the water. Um, and um, the water either needs to evaporate every day or you need to put mosquito dunks or you need a water wiggler. So, um, and then a butterfly's puddle and some people make like little sand puddles with some salt and there's recipes online. I'm not gonna go into that unless someone asks me, um, but butterflies do need minerals. And so this butterfly is puddling. That's what they call it. And some, uh, a couple of just, you know, your garden should have a way to infiltrate water. And here's a quick view of a a little rain garden and here are the pictures that I was sent later on and not much later on, like a year and a half later. Um, and here's another uh, rain garden with infiltration. I do a whole nother talk that's all about saving water, but you know, think about where you can infiltrate water. And if you have more questions about that, I can direct you to other resources. And here's a meadow. So 
all native plants are not shrubs. We, we do have meadows and, and I make them frequently. Um, and many things do live in meadows and um, many places in California were meadows. Um, so um, we, we looked at you know, plants, um, fall is not calendar fall. I have a blog that um, you can find by just, usually just says where I'm talking, but I do have a whole essay, when is fall? Um, when the Santa Ana winds end. So that's almost the end of what we would call fall. Um, I do plant, you know, on the west side all the way until August. I'm planting in Baldwin Hills next week, um, but it's in the shade. Um, I don't plant in the interior anymore. Now with climate change, I used to plant in summer. Um, what size to plant? Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, uh, native plants have a mycorrhizal ecology, so don't give them a lot of compost, a little tiny compost if they're struggling. But um, uh, if they get too much nitrogen, they will not behave. Um, and here is a picture of mycorrhiza attached to the roots of a plant. Um, and um, plants like mulch, native bees don't. So keeping a, an open patch of ground um, near the east side of the property that warms up first can help native ground nesting bees. But otherwise, to start your garden off, you do need some mulch. Later on, you can use your own prunings. Um, how to water. Um, I'm not going to go into this at length. Um, Tree of Life has much better than this. And I would, I would go on their site and pull down their watering. But basically, water them heavily to begin with. Most places, it's once a week. If you have clay, that could be longer. Um, plants can naturalize, but if you're in the fire zone, do not naturalize your plants. Watered native plants are more fire resistant than conventional plants. And then I'm not gonna address this at all because I'm sure we have more questions about milkweed. So, but here's the MP rotator and a couple few pretty pictures just because and um, now I'm going to take questions. So I might just leave the slides up while we take questions. I'll, I'll, I'll ask them. I okay. can ask them. This is Susan. Yes. So one of the questions that came in early was any advice for desert dwellers like Palm Springs? Yes. So um, there is uh, a couple of options for you. There's the Mojave Desert Land Trust. And um, and they sell plants in the fall. Um, there's the, the San Bernardino Riverside uh, native plant sale, which will happen in October. If you're looking for desert advice, I would go on um, summertree.org. And Robin Kobali has a lot of like desert natives for desert yards, caring for natives. And she is um, a great expert who's a biologist who's been giving advice out in the desert for a long time. So that's summer tree, that's the word summer and the word tree together.org. And that's where I would go look for that. Um, that's, that's great. Yes. Uh, so another question, um, someone wrote in that they have what they were told was native milkweed. It has tiny white flowers and develops huge balloons of fluffy white seeds yes. that float on the slightest breeze. After okay. the balloon burst, how do I know whether it is in fact native milkweed? And does that sound like it? Okay, so um, the the native milkweeds are mostly either white or pink, you know, or I mean, very as you were pale, mentioning, yeah, pink. Um, all the milkweeds have that fluff, so that's not diagnostic. If you're trying to figure out which milkweed you have and you, and it's from California. Um, you can either upload a picture of its flower to iNaturalist and, um, and, uh, and people will help you out with that. And iNaturalist does have its own automated system, or you can go on calflora.org, that's C-A-L-F-L-O-R-A.org and look at pictures of native milkweed and see if you can find something that looks close to your plant. So that's two options. Third is to take really good picture of the flower, really good picture of the leaves, um, a picture of the habit, and take that over to Theodore Payne or any CNPS. Um, when we start meeting again, 
meaning. So, um, but don't just take some random picture, a flower, a leaf, and, and a habit. So. Terrific. Okay. So uh, uh, th this presentation has been so wonderful and I've learned so much and the photographs have been especially um, helpful for us to imagine. And you've addressed a number of questions that I know many people have, but anything specific you haven't mentioned you'd like to about city gardens? Um, so, um, little plots of land, <laughs> you know, you can have a, a big habitat on a little plot of land and you can even have fairly large plants. Um, a lot of that is design and the Theodore Payne Foundation in Sunland does have a great design class. Um, or you can try, you know, the design software of, from Calscape, which is another um, great uh, CMPS product. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's a really large subject. And I did have a small garden and, um, and it's just, you know, you can't have everything. You have to figure out the plants that matter the most to you. Um, and, and, you know, be careful about your palate and and plan in advance, you know, where are you going to have infiltration? What, where is your water source going to be? All those things. That is so helpful. A real heartfelt thank you to you, Orchid Block. We've learned so much. I have anyway, because I know so little. So thank you for your time, sharing how we can incorporate native plants into our gardens and for us to think about how important it is and how beneficial it is. So. And thank you to all the women and philanthropy members for participating in our virtual event. And thank you too for our behind the scenes development staff, Melissa Delgadillo and Stella Pato and uh, Lauren Gutierrez. And of course, our wonderful women and philanthropy staff, Melissa Efron Hayek and Betty Montano. I want to remind you all, if you didn't know already, because I didn't mention it at the beginning, we will be holding our first person in-person program on September 8th. We'll be getting to look at gardens, but it's a tour of the sculpture garden on campus, September 8th from 12 to one, and you'll be getting a notice about it soon, but calendar yourself now for that. Thank you again, Orchid Black, for this extraordinary presentation and thank you all for being with us today. Goodbye. <laughs>